My name is Stephen Whiteman. I'm a senior lecturer in the Art and Architecture of China. And on behalf of my co-conveners, Austin Nevin, Head of Conservation, and Professor Suzanne Babe, Professor of Islamic Art, I welcome you to this evening's lecture by Professor Wei Zheng Lin of the University of Chicago. Art of the Buddhist World, History and Conservation is a lecture series presented this year with the support of the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation. Um, and part of the Center for Buddhist Art History and Conservation here at the Courtauld. We have organized this lecture series this year in preparation for the inauguration of a new MA program um, in uh, Buddhist art history and conservation, the appointment of two new colleagues, one in each of these fields, and the addition of Buddhist art across Asia to the undergraduate and PhD programs, as well as the MA program mentioned above. Over the course of four lectures in the autumn and spring terms, we are offering presentations on art and research from across the Buddhist world, including Southeast Asia, Japan, China, South Asia, and the Himalayas, from different historical periods and employing a range of methodologies in order to highlight the great diversity of, of work produced in regions, um, in which Buddhism is an active religion, and also to highlight the great diversity of the field itself. This past autumn, uh, we welcomed Rob Linroth from Northwestern University and Howie O'Neill from Edinburgh University. And tonight we have our third speaker in the series, Wei Zheng Lin. Wei Zheng Lin is Associate Professor of Art and Architectural History at the University of Chicago a particular specialist in the visual and material cultures of Buddhist art and architecture in medieval China and China's funerary practice throughout history. He is author of Building a Sacred Mountain, the Buddhist architecture of China's Mount Wutai, which appeared with University of Washington Press in 2014. He is editor of three additional volumes, including Exhibiting East Asian Art in a Global Context, Beijing Zhihua Se, Art, History and Technology, and the allure of matter, materiality from across Chinese art uh, from the Smart Museum, University of Chicago. His more than 30 articles have appeared in a wide range of leading journals in the US and China, covering an equally wide range of topics. Medieval Buddhism, of course, but also modern and contemporary architectural practice, including studies of arguably the first historian of Chinese architecture, Liang Sicheng, and the forthcoming essay, Building Modern China in the Vision of the First Female Chinese Architect, Lin Huiyin, in a volume forthcoming entitled Women in the Arts and Archaeology of Asia. Wei is also faculty director of the Dispersed China Arch... Uh, excuse me, I need to start that sentence again. Wei is also faculty director of the Dispersed Chinese Art Digitization Project a long-standing digital initiative based at the University of Chicago that digitally reintegrates artifacts removed from Buddhist sites that have been dispersed into public and private collections around the world. This is a project, just as an aside, that I've known of for a long time and is really a remarkable effort to help recontextualize um, art that has been, as I say, diverse, uh, removed from its site, original sites of context and brought together in a virtual realm, a real demonstration of what um, digital technology makes possible in archeology span and for site-based research. Under Wei's direction, the project continues to work um, that to date has addressed three important sites, Longman in Hunan province, a sixth century complex that is perhaps China's most famous cave temple site, Tianlongshan, a slightly later system of shrines in Shanxi province, and Zhihua Se, a 15th century temple in Beijing with elaborate coffered ceilings. His talk tonight relates to this latest project. And with that, I invite you to join me in welcoming Professor Wei Zheng Lin for this evening's talk, Structuring a Virtual World of the Buddha, in the case of the 10,000 Buddha's pavilion Wan Fu Ge in Beijing Zhihua Temple. Thank you so much for joining us, Wei, and I'll hand it over to you. All right. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And then it's a great pleasure to be here today. And thank you all for joining the, the webinar. And first, I would like to, to thank Stephen for the invitation. You know, I live in London, so when I saw Stephen's uh, the invitation, I got so excited about the opportunity of visiting the city. 
Well, it didn't really work out exactly uh, the, the way I, I, I hoped, but given the circumstance, I, I'm just grateful to have this opportunity to share, to share my work with you in UK or elsewhere via the webinar. Uh, the work I would like to share with you today is part of the biggest, uh, biggest, the bigger project the uh, the Stephen uh, just introduced is called the Dispersed Chinese Art Dis Digitalization Project, initiated by the Center of, of for the Art of East Asia at the University of Chicago. So we started this project about three years ago, though the progress has been interrupted by very much by the pandemic. Uh, we have been able to complete almost our first scanning task the Beijing Zuhua Temple, and which is the topic of my talk today. Yeah, my presentation is not exactly about the digital project uh, or the technology. Instead, it is the research on the Buddhist pavilion of the temple informed by the result of the digital project. And I'm eager to hear what you have to say and looking forward to hearing your comments and the questions after the talk. So uh, let me start. So, uh, near today is Beijing Soho, one of the city's major shopping centers inside the second wing row is a gem of historical Buddhist heritage, the Tsuhua Temple, the temple of transformative wisdom. Completed in 1444 during the Ming Dynasty, the Tsuhua Temple was commissioned by Wang Zhen, the most in influential eunuch at the court with the permission granted directly from the emperor. It was not a, the grandest nor largest Buddhist temple of its time, uh, the Zuha Temple nonetheless attained prominence uh, second only to a few, attested by its prestigious location in the proximity of the Forbidden City. It was recorded that the temple's architecture was constructed with precious building materials and superb craftsmanship. Fortunately, the Zuha Temple survived as one, one of the best preserved Ming architectural complexes, giving us a rare opportunity to study its art and architecture in, great, in much greater detail. The temple layout consists of five courtyards along the central axis. Uh, each courtyard features a main hall with two subsidiary structures facing, facing each other, except for the third courtyard, dominated by the only multi-story structure within the temple precinct. And you see the image of the uh, pavilion right here. It is a two-story pavilion of which the first or lower level is called Ru Lai Dian or Hall of Shakyamuni, and the second or upper level, Wan Fu Ge, 10,000 Buddhas Pavilion. Though it has been restored in the past, the architecture of the two-story structure, as well as the building uh, uh, of the two front courtyards, largely remain intact. The only notable exception are the two missing decorative recessed covered seating, one originally in the Wan Fu Pavilion, as seen in the historical photo, uh, to your right, in uh, the uh, taken in the early 1930s, now in a collection of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Arts, right here. And the other in the Zihua Hall, the Men Buddha Hall in the second courtyard, now in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So this is the original uh, place for the coffer seating right, right now in the museum. So how these two coffer seatings ended up in the two US museums during the 1930s is a topic of research by itself and delving into it will take us too far afield today. My presentation, uh, my presentation instead is to understand the two-story pavilion, both architecturally and religiously in its entirety. The missing coffer seating above the central Buddha, however, renders the structure and its, and its iconographical program incomplete. So this is on the second, uh, second level, uh, it's a pavilion of the one, the, the one for pavilion. So the, uh, the, the missing coffer scene will be right here. So recently collaborating with the two museums in the US and the Tsuha Temple, the Center for the Art of East Asia at the, at the University of Chicago, teaming up with the Xi'an Jiao Tong University in China uh, has reconstructed the one for pavilion digitally with the missing coffer seating we instate virtually. So that's, uh, so that's a, the, the, the image of the working, the scanning itself. And here is a reconstruction. This presentation largely was inspired by the reconstruction, a reconstructed virtual space as seen in the image to your left, shedding light on the possible reading of the Buddhist structures releases significance as initiated, uh, initially intended. 
When I saw the complete, quote unquote, complete pavilion interior for the first time, I was stunned to realize how the space is perceived much differently. Now the central Buddha is seen in the background of the covered sitting and wrapped around by the miniature Buddhist uh, structures underneath. So that's the cover scene. And then here is a series of the small structures right there. And he'll give you a better view of the small structures right there. So most surprisingly, the cover sitting measuring 4.14 square meters and 5.13 meters from the floor appears oversized in the relatively in intimate in interior of the pavilion's upper level. So, and then the, the sitting height is even shorter if we uh, if measure from the bottom of the small structure right here. So in comparison, after being reunited digitally with the Tsihua Hall, another cover sitting now in the Philadelphia Museum of Art doesn't seem overwhelming, creating a special focus for the Buddha icons without overpowering them. So the cover sitting or Zaojing in Chinese has a long history traced back to as early as the Han Dynasty around the first and second century CE. It doesn't serve a structural function, but has been a vital component of interior decoration since then. Used chiefly in high-ranking buildings such as palatial architectural or prominent religious structures, the coffer scene marks the spatial center reserved for or occupied by emperor or the Buddha. So the example I'm using right here is a throne hall in the Forbidden City. As such, the one for pavilion now with uh, its restored cover seating, it raises the question of how it affects the interior spatial co conception and shapes its religious significance. Ultimately, why was the cover seating made in such a dimension that it looks out of place? Also, given that of the 80 plus existing cover seating in China today, most of which are seen on or from the ground level, the wonderful pavilion is one of the only three extent examples where the cover ceiling is installed in a higher level. Then what do we make of all this in our reading of the pavilion's religious, religious, religious space and the iconography it houses? The long-standing tradition of pre-modern Chinese architecture built mainly in wood is characterized by horizontal sprawl of spatial arrangement and building complexes. In this tradition, Single-story buildings are the norm, while multi-story structures, notably towers or their Buddhist counterparts, pagodas, stand out in comparison. A third building type, the topic of this presentation, is pavilion, or ge in Chinese, consisting, consisting of two or more stacked stories fully accessible through stairs. Compared with other building type, pavilions have an obvious advantage in their ability to accommodate more interior space while offering an elevated and privileged uh, viewpoint. However, most, most prestigious buildings in China's history had never taken the form of pavilion. So just think about, you know, Forbidden City along the central axis, all the buildings there are single story uh, building rather than a pavilion. So Pavilion enters China's Buddhist architecture as early as the fourth century, and yet they seem less significant than say single-story Buddha hall or high-rising pagodas. In a building tradition that did not favor tall structures, why built multi-story pavilions in the first place? Especially as seen in a one for pavilion. When a building has stacked uh, stories, it, uh, its interior would take on a different orientation from horizontal to vertical, evoking a spatial conception very different from a single story building or a narrow towering pagodas. To answer our question, I will first investigate pavilions as a building type in Ming architecture and how pavilions cultivated a spatial knowledge through its multi-level structure historically until the Ming dynasty. As will be demonstrated, the nature of pavilions that is neither horizontal nor high rising makes them more spatially flexible and multifunctional in ways that other building types are not. The multi-levelness of, of Buddhist pavilions that structures the iconography therein, I argue, creates multi-layered multi religious significance inside and outside the architecture and configure a virtual world of the Buddha, as we shall see in the case of Wanpo Pavilion at the Tsihua Temple. So this is my first section. Pavilion, pavilions built inside Buddhist monasteries were already mentioned, 
sporadically in the fourth and fifth century texts. Since early on, pavilions have been defined as tall structures consisting of stacked stories. Early Buddhist pavilions were constructed for specific purposes, such as meditation, Chang'e, enshrinement of relics, Foyage, and a, a accommodation of large icons or Da Xiang'e, taking advantage of the better secluded upper levels and more spacious interior. The Tang Dynasty witnessed a surge of the pavilion's role in the configuration of the, temple, of the Buddhist temple. Texts describe certain monet, uh, monastic cloisters centered with the pavilions or Ge Yuan, dedicated to specific Buddha or Bodhisattva, such as a pavilion of Manjusri or Wen Ge. So the image right here you are seeing is that we, construct, we constructed pavilion of Manjusri. Uh, the, uh, we call it to have been built in the uh, great uh, the 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 the, the uh, Xinshan Monastery in Tang Chang'an. So further, multi-story pavilions began to occupy a more prominent position aligned with the main Buddha Hall along the central axis. Though no medieval monastic complexes survived, murals in the cave murals, as you are seeing right here in the caves near today's Dunhuang. Uh, show the monast monastic complex with buildings of increasing grandeur along the central axis. Actually, the, uh, the, the historical text kind of give us an expression that Tang Dynasty is a time when the pav pavilions were utilized the most. Uh, the, uh, it is not represented right here, but the, uh, a lot of records talk about the, the, uh, the entrance into the monastery, San, San Men, so the entrance gate will be built with two or three uh, the uh, stories above. But you can see right here, even the, the pavilions were built for the subsidiary uh, buildings right here in the corner tower. But most important will be the pavilions built along the central axis behind the, the Buddha hall that gives uh, increasing rising the, the, roof, the, the, the roof line and give the, 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 the presentation, the visual presentation of the uh, architectural landscape. So with this height, the pavilion was essential in vitalizing the monastic topography, creating a climax in the architectural landscape of the temple. With a few exceptions, however, the pavilion was almost never used as the main Buddha hall. Interestingly, in a century af after the, the Tang, from the Song to the Ming dynasties, approximately uh, the 10th century through the 15th century, pavilions in Buddhist temple were reduced to one to two of them, on the central axis. But the reason was not financial or building technology, whether it was because, because of how pavilions were functioned. More and more, all major Buddhist halls are lined up to form an extended central axis. Each hall is complemented by two subsidiary buildings of the same style. So for example, this main Buddha hall has two subsidiary buildings right here. And then each of them on the central axis has their own sub subsidiary buildings. And then the biggest one will be the main Buddha hall. The tallest one is, is the pavilion. And the pavilion is the only uh, the multi-story structure in the entire building complex. So you see the, uh, the uh, an architectural hierarchy right here based on their size and scale. So, and then the grouping of the buildings eventually turned into the Koya system in which the main Buddha hall formed the temple's religious center, as you can see in the example here. And the pavilion takes the second because of its height. Each major Buddha hall served uh, a specific religious purpose. Functions of subsidiary halls in Buddhist temple also gradually become consistent regardless of sect sectarian differences. Only the pavilion being multi-storied did not, didn't have a, fun, uh, a set function and was used for more than one purpose. Tianjie Temple or Tianjie Si, Temple of Heavenly Rome, for instance, built under the imperial, imperial auspices was one of the five major Buddhist temples in Nanjing, the first Ming capital until 1420. As seen in the illustration dated to 1607, two-story pavilion located close to the rear wall of the temple climaxes in a series of the major halls uh, built along the central axis on the rising topography. It was called Pavilion of Buddha Vajrayana or Piru, Piru Ge, built in 1413, but no longer standing. According to the dedicatory text, the pavilion's two stories, and I quote here, the upper level enshrines the three bodies of the Buddha set off by image of 
images of 10,000 Buddhas. To the essential triads left and right are cabinets for storing all Buddhist canons. Behind the cabinets is a statue of, of Avalokitesvara, along with 10 things of the Buddha's universal gateway. The lower level is dedicated to the uh, Buddha Vayuchana, sitting on the lotus seat, surrounded by lotus, uh, lotus leaves. It's showing an image of the Buddha. On either side of Vayuchana are 18 ahas and 20 devas. The pavilion is decorated with jeweled canopies, banners, textiles, in addition to incense, lamps, fruits, and flowers to assist anyone who visits and ascends the pavilion to worship the in, uh, indescribable room as the supreme enlightenment arises in one's mind." End quote. So by the meantime, as indicated in the text, and I highlight all the uh, iconographical components described in the text, Buddhist pavilions have become, have become a unique building type for their uh, multifunctionality and releases program inside seemingly constituted ad hoc. In this light, returning to the Tsuha temple, we should see a similar architectural hierarchy of the temple configuration. Though no surviving epi uh, epigraphic text describe, describe the uh, temple buildings in detail, the main Buddha hall, Tsuha Dian is unambiguously, uh, unambiguous release, release the center of the front section. And then the, uh, it's right here, pointed by the arrow. Yet it is the two-story pavilion, uh, the tallest and largest structure that occupies the physical center of the temple precinct. The main Buddha hall features Buddhas of triple times or San Sifu accompanied by 18 ahas. Then the lower level of the two-story pavilion has a Shakyamuni Buddha attended by two celestial kings, Indra and Brahma. Sutra cabinets com containing a complete set of Buddhist uh, canons and images of 10,000 Buddhas. Though it is called Hall of Shakyamuni or Rulai, Rulai Dian, its content actually has more. On the second floor, known as 10,000 uh, Buddhas, 10,000 Buddhas Hall or one for girl, it features in fact, a Buddha triad representing the three, three manifestations of the Buddha or San Shenfo, surrounded by 10,000 Buddhas. The multifunctionality of the Wulai Ho and Wan Fu pavilion combined is consistent with, the, with what one would expect to see in uh, Buddhist pavilions during the Ming time. Still, it is highly unusual in the history of Chinese architecture to name each level of one single pavilion separately. So as you can see, the, plaque, the, the name plaque right here indicating they are two, almost like two different structures. So this articulation of the two levels as two separate spaces seems to su suggest an emphatic difference between them. However, I should argue pavilions as a building type are especially much more complicated than we have, uh, we have realized. In 1422 to 24, a monumental three-story pavilion about 38 meters in height was constructed at the Yunyan Monastery in today's Suzhou, or Suzhou Yunyan Chan Si. Though no longer existing, the pavilion is recorded to have uh, contained the following icons. And then this, the text is too long, so I, I don't have time to go through them, but I want to bring your attention to the content, uh, the iconographical content housed in the pavilion. So I quote here. The Buddhas of triple times, an image of 10,000 Buddhas are enshrined on the top level, uh, top floor. The middle of the pavilion is dedicated to the Avalokitesvara and Devas, end quote. It is unclear whether the middle in a quote refers to the middle level or in the middle of the pavilion. But since the record skips the lower level, most likely the Avalokitesvara accommodated inside the Buddhist pavilion was a castle standing statue taking up the first two levels. If that were the case, the pavilion's interior would have been constructed with an upper, upper floor on top of a very tall lower floor to contain all the iconic components. What I want to point out is this, the multi-level structure makes a wide range of spatial possibilities, but also their complexities. In any event, I should prove that the one for pavilion, though uh, they are smaller than the pavilion at the Yunyan Monastery, is no less complex. Before getting into that, I would now like to, to turn to two more spatial aspects critical to understanding uh, Chinese Buddhist pavilions. 
So the first, once you know that the definition of levels in tall structures in Chinese architecture is not as crystal clear as one may expect. For example, the much celebrated 15 level brick pagoda at the Songyue Monastery dated to uh, 523 consists of a tall lower level shaft and 14 densely stacked, stacked couple, uh, upper levels. Records about the brick pagoda never fail to mention the 15 levels, but the brick structure essentially is a hollow shell that has no actual levels. This dis discrepancy between the exterior and interior has problematized the multi-levelness of any tall structure, including pavilions, since early on. In Buddhist, archi in Buddhist architecture, many of the early pavilions for which we have records were constructed to accommodate colossal Buddhist images from anywhere 10 to 40 meters tall, thus forsaking interior, uh, in interior divisions. Indeed, pavilions would be the only building type that could meet the needs for housing colossal icons in such case, cases as Mogao Cave 96, the Im image to your left, and the Guanyin Pavilion of Dula Temple dated 984 in today's Jixian Hebei, the image to your to, uh, left and right, sorry. However, in so doing, the pavilion also contradicts its basic definition as structure consisting of stacked uh, stories. So as seen in these two examples, Neither is a true multi-level pavilion, but each creates a vertical space for the gigantic icon while providing devout, devout Buddhists with different viewpoints and angles on the incomplete levels. So what I want to say is that, the, uh, for example, so uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Mogul Cave 96, basic, the, the, uh, the timber fence structure built over the cliff, the, 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 the uh, colossal Buddha uh, carved out of the, the cliff, and then, uh, the levels right here are basically incomplete, so leaving the space right in the middle for to accommodate the class of Buddha. And for Guanyin Pavilion, that's the same thing. You know, all the levels right here, the uh, top level right here, uh, is a, it's not complete, leaving the cent, uh, 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 an opening in the middle to accommodate the uh, the uh, the class of class of uh, statue of the, uh, Shak, the Bodhisattva. So according to Fu Xinian, a preeminent architectural historian in China, the timber frame structure of the Guanyin Pavilion was designed precisely with how one would see the class of icon in mind. On the ground level, one sees only the Bodhisattva's legs until one reaches the central bay, where the Bodhisattva would be perceived disproportionately at a steep angle with his face uh, per perceptually out of reach. Ascending to the top level, the worshiper can now see and only see the Bodhisattva's face, uh, face close up, whose 11 hats are wrapped around under the copper ceiling, the oldest Zhao Jing to survive today. In other words, ascending through the levels upward, one is to explore the sacred icon by negotiating between its full length and fragmented vision of the icon and experience structured architecturally through the pavilion. A 19th century scholar, when visiting another uh, Guanyin Pavilion to venerate uh, a similar class of statue of the Bodhisattva writes, and I quote here, the statue casting iron is about 22 meters tall. I couldn't see the Buddha's face until I climb up to the top floor where his countenance is dignified and marvelous in the Buddha's sacred room, end quote. So to, to observe and worship the icon, the levels of the multi-story multi pavilions are to be traversed vertically. Each level is separated from others, but also structured within one single timber frame. The slippage between a complete view and many partial views of the statue reveals profound meanings of the icon aspiring to the sacred room of the Bodhisattva. This also reminds us how the Buddha's body is conceived. For example, in the Zheng Yi Ahan Jing one week, and I quote here, the Buddha's body is green and also unfathomable. The reason is that other than devas, no one could fabricate it, the Buddha's body. It is unmeasurable, so one doesn't, fa doesn't describe it so long or so short. The Buddha's voice, wisdom, and persuasion are un unimaginable. Unmatchable in the secular, secular world, so is the room of the Buddha, end quote. To be sure, Buddhist pavilions were also built with complete levels. 
From the Song Dynasty onwards, as discussed earlier, pavilions became more multifunctional over time. Concurrently, more were built with two interior levels to accommodate more, uh, more complex iconographical program. Yet even in, a case, in the cases where the interior space is divided into separate levels, the slippage and contradictions discussed earlier are still relevant. Unfortunately, no pavilions built with two levels and icon iconography survived intact before the Ming Dynasty. So instead, I will use the timber pagoda dated to 1056 in Yingxian Shanxi for the purpose of our discussion. Measured uh, 67 meters tall, the timber pagoda consists of a tall first level superimposed with four upper levels of increasingly diminished height and, and diameter. Each level contains a set of icons at the very center. The pagoda is built architecturally in such a way that, as Fu Xinian notes, the worshiper gains a view of the icon with the same angle on each of the four higher levels. So as you can see right here, you know, so when you, when you travel through the levels, you know, the basic, the, the viewing, view, viewing angle will be the same. So because of, because of time constraint, I won't, I won't get into the pagoda's uh, iconographical program. It suffices to say that the five sets of icons, as it turns out, are intrinsically related. Starting from the Vajrayana Buddha seated on the lotus pedestal uh, on the bottom level and ended with another Vajrayana Buddha on the top level and each crowned by the copper city. So to see, thus understand the iconography structured in the pagoda, one is required to enter and ascend to observe the five sets of icons separated by levels yet in a continuous sequence. The timber, the timber pagoda, just like most pavilions of this time, and actually the, tim the, the timber pagoda you are seeing right here is built in a very similar way uh, uh, with which the, the, the pavilions of the time uh, was, uh, was, const uh, the, uh, was constructed. So the, the tim timber pagoda, just like most pavilions of the time, is consisted of stacked stories in a real sense because there's a true uh, there are divisions. But the physical level divisions are also connecting tissues that tie them together. Each level of, of a Buddhist pavilion is separate, yet connected with others of the same structure, thus entailing us to see each level or story of the pavilion more holistically as an individual level, one of the levels, and one in the entire structure simultaneously. As such, I suggest, so this is the, 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 the true division. So they are, they, the division separate them, they separate each level, but at the same time also serving as the, the connecting tissue, connecting them together. So in this regard, I suggest instead of level or story, both translations of cheng in Chinese, we should see pavilions, horizontal floors as spatial layers interpenetrated vertically. In this sense, the religious significance of pavilions is revealed when the worshiper penetrates layer upon layer of vertical depth. This is especially the case if, if we examine more closely the structure of the later pavilions during the Song to Ming period. Pavilions are structures that consist of stacked stories or levels. We also mean it literally. Chinese timber frame architecture is, is essentially a, trop, uh, a tripa, tripartite structure consisting of a lintel and post framework, brackets, and a roof frame. To build a multi-story pavilion, such as the one that you're seeing right here, is to repeat the lintel and post framework and brackets, one on top of another under one single roof. So here you have the brackets, uh, the, the columns, brackets, the columns, and brackets. If you want to build more, and then you just repeat this with them, you know, on top, one, one on top of another. Yet joining uh, the stories together, the, you know, you have, when you have many stories, when you join, the, when you join them together, vertically, also the, 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 uh, the uh, by doing that, also increase the risk of tilting the structure sideways. In building pavilions or pagoda in this regard, the most challenging issue would be setting an upper level on the level below, firmly and stably. To this issue, the most enduring solution throughout China's building history was to add a platform called pingzuo, or flat base, between levels, a substructure also translated as mezzanine. 
For massive hotel in structure, the massing level could take up significant space. In Guan Pavilion, for example, the mezzanine has the height to be considered as a story by itself. So even there's a stair installed there to facilitate the going up and down between the first and second levels. As such, a structurally critical layer, the mezzanine also widens the gap between stories, in a, sense, in a sense, making penetrating spatial layers vertically more a laborious process. In a century preceding the Ming Dynasty, the building technology was indeed advanced to diminish the gap created by the mezzanine. The, detail, the details of the technologi uh, technological developments are still not completely clear to us due to the lack of actual building examples, but pragmatic needs most likely drove the advancement. My first example is the Maitreya Pavilion or Cixige of the Longxin Temple in Zhengding, Hebei. Built in the 12th century during the Northern Song, the pavilion measuring 19.96 meters in height appears small with the 9.95 meters standing wooden statue of the Bodhisattva Maitreya or 11.35 meters with the back halo. To open up the interior space and allow the viewers to gain a clear view of the Buddha's entire length, the builder eliminates the mezzanine. Instead, two eve and two interior columns rise all the way up to support the uh, roof typings, turning the two stack levels into one cohesive structure. So the two columns have been called in Chinese as tongzhu, so kind of penetrate the entire structure from vertically, so kind of turning the initial stacks levels into one cohesive structure. So, and then the, um, uh, seems like the, uh, the, the, the stairs will be up to the, to the backside of the, uh, the, the building. So you climb up there and this is a gallery level. So from here, you can see the different angle of the statue. So in my second example, sorry. So in my second example, the pavilion of revolving sutra cabinet also in the Longxin Temple was similarly built in order to accommodate a sizable revolving sutra cabinet on the lower level, forcing the builder to el eliminate the mezzanine and improve and improvise a much simplified supporting system. So uh, you can see right here, there's a no mezzanine level right here because it, it really requires a larger space on the first floor, so it becomes very tall. But at the same time, but at the same time, the uh, uh, the at the same time, the, the pavilion has an additional function, enshrining a Buddha statue attended by two bodhisattvas in the central bay, right above the revolving sutra cabinet on the upper level. So in both examples, a more spacious interior and multifunctionality necessitated builders to, Im to improve the structure and diminish the role of the mezzanine. The result is a better holistically assembled overall structure that no longer treats the pavilion as stacked levels. With a more fluid spatial connections between levels, we can now truly see pavilions as consisting of interpenetrated layers one upon another vertically. So we have discussed a few critical changes that shaped the pavilion architecture from the Song Dynasty onwards. By the Ming Dynasty, the pavilion in a Buddhist temple was used more as the climax of the monastic uh, landscape in a series of building, buildings along the central axis. Meanwhile, as pavilions became more uh, multifunctional, architecturally, their interior levels also appear more connected. With this, we can now turn to the one for pavilion at the Zihua Temple. The height of the pavilion is about 17 meters and two rows of columns front and back rise through the two levels until reaching to support the brackets of the upper level, which in turn support the longest crossbeam of the roof structure. And the two levels are divided only by a narrow mezzanine, as you can see right here, uh, to maximize the seating height of the first floor at 5.86 meters versus the height of the upper level, 4.42 meters. The small division between the two levels can also be observed from the facade. As seen in the photo, a row of rim covers are called yan ciban, literally boards shaped in white, white goose wings, smooths out the joint seam of the two levels. So right here, kind of the uh, kind of smooth out the, the joining seams right between the two levels. 
So the, the mezzanine appears so insignificant that the top level looks like sitting on the lower one effortlessly. Accordingly, the two levels essentially are two interpenetrated layers structured holistically into one integrated space under one, uh, under one roof. This is also in, uh, evidence in the 10,000 Buddha teeth throughout the entire building. Small niches together, altogether about 10,000, each containing a small sitting Buddha, cover the lower levels left, right, and back wall, continuing into the same three walls on the, on the upper level. So this is a cloud, uh, the point cloud, uh, the cross section, sorry, the cross section uh, generated by the scanning data. And then the, uh, so you can see, so, so it gives you a, a precise measurements and then relationship between the, among the objects inside the building. So you see the small dots in the background right here, they are niches of the, uh, the, the 10,000 Buddhas. They go all the way from the side of the lower floor onto the same wall of the, uh, the, the second, second level. So in other words, the 10,000 Buddha motifs is meant to unify the two levels into one by merging them regardless of the division. Therefore, the pavilion in its entirety should be more appropriately called 10,000 Buddha's pavilion. So that's my argument. I think the entire building should be called a pavilion rather than, you know, a, a, the, the, uh, as now that people understand the pavilion refers to the, the second level. As such, I would further suggest that the coffer sitting initially installed on the upper level and now restored digitally was actually designed considering the scale and measurements of the entire structure as if there's no division. If so, the cover sitting size, unusually immense for the upper level becomes more reasonable and understandable. Concurrently, it also encourages a reading of the two levels iconographies as one continuous program from the first level into the second. On the lower level, a statue of Shakyamuni Buddha sits on the lotus throne in meditation with his right, right hand touching the earth, a mudra recalling the moment of the Buddha's enlightenment while sitting under the boat. However, the combination of the earth touching Buddha with the two deva kings, Brahma to his right and Indra to his left, is rare. My colleague Kathleen Jiang has suggested that the role of the two deva kings may have derived from uh, the sutra called Puyao Jing. According to the Puyao Jing, after the Shakyamuni attained enlightenment, Brahma and Indra came urging him to preach the way to achieve wisdom. In other words, the Shakyamuni Buddha with the earth touching mudra rehearses the moment of his enlightenment and two attending Deva kings represent the moment after when the Buddha was, decide, was determined to turn a wheel. So given the two L-shaped uh, sutra cabinets right there, and I'll give you a close, close view right there. So uh, given the two L-shaped sutra cabinets that flank the central three icons stem for the wisdom of the Buddha, this interpretation is plausible. So here, the, the central Buddha earth touching mudra showing, uh, uh, rehearsing the moment of his enlightenment. And then the moment after, then your, the two devas came to urge him to preach and then he decided to turn the wheel and the content of the, the, his preaching will be, uh, will be uh, the canons in, with, uh, stored in the cabinets right here. So on the other hand, if we take the iconography on the upper level into account, we should see more layers of meanings. On the upper level, right above the Shakyamuni is the Vayakana, Vayachana Buddha seated on the lotus with multi-level petals. So here is the Vayachana Buddha. I give you a little thumbnail right here so you can see the relationship between the two Buddhas, Shakyamuni and the Vayachana on top. Together with the Vayachana Buddha to his left and Shakyamuni to his right, the three Buddhas on the second level have been identified as three, threefold uh, body of the Buddha or Trikaya, Sanson, is on, unequivocally and uh, appropriate the center of the entire pavilion. So, and uh, as the universal Buddha that conceptually embodies the 10,000 Buddha, 10, Buddhas in the numerous world of the universe. So don't, so just as I noted before, the entire building should be called the 10,000 Buddha pavilions. And so uh, appropriately the, the Vajrayana Buddha at the center embodies that concept. And, 
uh, the, uh, uh, and the, the eternal and unchanging body of the Vajrayana Buddha also aptly symbolizes the true teaching or fashion uh, that Dhammakaya materialized in the canons stored in the sutra cabinets on the lower level. So I sh I'm showing you the, uh, the restored scene so you can see the relationship with the, uh, the, uh, the, the coffer scene as well. And then with, uh, with the idea of, ideas of Dhammakaya, the Vajrayana Buddha also, in, also materialized the the uh, uh, the canons stored on the first floor uh, in the in the sutra cabinets. So further in the Sino Tibetan Buddhist tradition to which the Buddhist practices at the Tsuha Temple conformed, the Vajrayana Buddha on the upper level, identified by the the, the Vajra Mudra or Zhiquan Yin, he holds, replacing the the Shakyamuni Buddha on the lower level, assumes the position of the ultimate Buddhist wisdom. The Vajrayana Buddha, as you see right here, who wears five petal jeweled crown representing Buddhas of five wisdoms of Uzi Wulai, would suggest the center he sits in the diamond world mandala or Jingangjie Mantoro. During the Ming Dynasty, the image of Vajrayana Buddha is often accompanied by 20 devas who occupy the outer area of the diamond world mandala. However, that is not the case the Vajrayana Buddha on the one for provenience on the upper level because we don't see the 20 devas. Yet Brahma and Indra, two leaders of the 20 deva, uh, do appear on the lower level as we have seen. So it's right here on the lower level. I'm going to give you a better view right here. So this is the two, uh, the, the leaders of the 20 devas who sit in the outer, air, outer uh, area of the diamond world, Mandana. So it seems to suggest that the two deva kings representing the 20 devas are there on the first floor to usher the visitors after, after uh, observing the Shakyamuni's enlightenment to ascend to venerate the Vajrayana Buddha of the Diamond World Mandala on the upper level. So it shows you know, the, the icons, they not only have the relationship among them horizontally, but also there's a complicated relationship vertically between the two levels. Scott have pointed out that the arrangement of Vajrayana Buddha above the Sutra cabinets in the Wonderful Pavilion is preceded by the Sutra Hall or Zhang Dian, the subsidiary hall in the second court. The Vajrayana Buddha with the same Vajra Mudra sitting on the, on the lotus above the Sutra cabinet can be seen underneath the coffer sitting. So it's right here. It's, you can really see very well. So it's very revealing when you see it's the same uh, Vajrayana Buddha sitting on top again on the, the uh, on top of the uh, sutra cabinet. So you can see how similar uh, they, are, they are to each other. The similarity between the two Vajrayana Buddha and their, their physical relationship with the sutra cabinets beneath them is conspicuous. Yet whereas sutra in the, the sutra hall provides the visitors only with a, with a glimpse of the Vajrayana Buddha as they enter the hall, the wonderful pavilion turns the sutra Sutra Hall into a two-story structure where one is able to access and observe the Vajrayana Buddha face to face. So in the Sutra Hall, one comes in, you can see it. You can, can see that revelation of the, the, the Vajrayana Buddha on top of the Sutra cabinet. But in the one for pavilion, that's different. Not only you can see, but you can ascend and observe the Vajrayana Buddha on the second level face to face. Further, on the upper level of the one for pavilion, attentive visitors will notice how the ceiling height goes higher toward the center. The builder must have realized how the ceiling, uh, how the ceiling would be relatively low with a sizable copper ceiling in the middle. A crescent shaped beam called Sun Pa Wan Liang that bears the weight of the roof superstructure is installed to elevate the ceiling in the right and left base to the height of the copper ceiling. Then a series of the small Buddhist structures known as heavenly pa pa uh, palaces and pavilions or Tiangong Loga, set between uh, the longest tie beams, then appears to protrude from above, physically separating the copper ceiling from the interior. So what I want to say is that, you know, the ceiling could be this low because you have the brackets right here, but then using this uh, crescent shaped beams to elevate the ceiling to the height. So it's, now you have the ceiling line right here to the height of the, the cover ceiling. But then you have the, uh, uh, the Tiangong Logo heavenly palaces, palaces and towers right here to emphasize the central, uh, the, uh, the area 
separating the two areas on, uh, on both sides, but at the same time, creating a separation between the cover scene and the interior. So you can see this uh, wheels, uh, the photos of the site with a crescent shaped uh, beams right here. And then in the reconstruction, that's clear, that's even more, uh, even clearer right here. So the ceiling height go higher, but the, the, the series of the buildings right here, small buildings right here separate and highlights the central area. So seen from below, the layer of heavenly palaces and pavilions, thanks to their miniature scale, also appears like a level high up, signaling yet a higher room of the Kafka sitting beyond in great height. Indeed, with its monumental size, the Kafka sitting is not supposed to be seen in this close distance on the upper level. Yet the layers of levels inside the pavilion are to be traversed and penetrated by the worshippers advancing through the structured iconographical program until he or she arrives in front of Vajrayana Buddha. It is a virtual world of the Buddha specialized in the pavilion, and it is through the Vajrayana Buddha who elevates to the height of the heavenly palaces and pavilions that the worshiper can aspire to the higher room of higher room visualized in the Kafka city. So in conclusion, indeed, uh, not as tall as pagodas, nor as prominent as the main Buddha hall. Buddhist pavilions of Fogge nonetheless had played a unique role in Buddhist architecture. The pavilion's upper levels always engaged the worshiper, both inside and outside the structure in ways that couldn't be replicated in other building types. When examining the site, the site plan of the Tsuha temple, it is peculiar to see the centrally located one for pavilion by itself without any subsidiary halls. Given that a vertical axis aligned the Shakyamuni and Vayakana, uh, Vayakana, as well as the heavenly palaces and pavilions and the coffer scene above them, it is likely that the worshiper would circumambulate either the pavilion outside or the upper level around the veranda. So here, this central axis, almost like, almost like the central vertical axis right here. And this is a veranda, either uh, the uh, worshiper can circumambulate the entire building outside or ascend to a second floor going out to veranda and circumambulate the entire building. Either way, the open space around the uh, one for pavilion is apparently reserved for the ritual circumambulation. Interestingly, as this cross section shows, the two Buddhas, that is the vertical center of the circumambulation, are actually not aligned perfectly with the Vayakana Buddha on the second floor set further into the rear we are half of the interior. This seemingly un, uh, unintended error, in fact, is also a calculated design to engage the viewer with, with its unique uh, multi-level structure. If we draw a, a 25 degree viewing angle for a visitor of 170 centimeter tall, the visitor should gain a view of the Shakyamuni with the entire uh, interior height in the background. The same viewing angle would also allow the visitor to glimpse the Vajrayana Buddha on the second floor outside on the ground while approaching it along the central axis. So you can see that's the moment where you can see the both image, both image on the 25 uh, degree, the viewing angle. And that's the viewing angle you can see the, uh, once you enter the hall, you can see the, uh, the Shaka Buddha on the first floor as well. So in a sense, the pavilion structure drags, uh, the, the pavilion's architecture drags the visitor into the orbit by revealing its vertical axis, even before he or she starts the, the circumambulation. The division, or rather the connection of the pavilion's two levels is critical to one's religious, religious experience, both outside and inside the structure. And the juxtaposition of outside and inside, lower and upper levels compel us to appreciate and understand Buddhist pavilions in ways that deserve further research. Thank you. So that's all my presentation. And before I end, I want to thank all the, the, uh, the institutions right here, Beijing Zuhua Temple and Xi'an Jiao Tong University in China, Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, Philadelphia Museum of Art, and Tsinghua University in China. And of course, the Cyrus Tong Foundation who sponsored the project and to my colleagues at the University of Chicago Center of Art of East Asia. Thank you for your listening. And I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. This is Susan Babai speaking. I am a party to this operation with Austin Nevin and 
Stephen Whiteman, and um, we are delighted. Thank you for this magnificent talk. I loved uh, learning more about how these temples are constructed, actually, and your digital reconstructions really enhance one's understanding to a point that could have not been quite imagined with that clarity. And those coffered ceilings, if I may just suggest, are great subject for thinking about cultural cir circulation and, and looking across East-West Asian connections, perhaps, uh, as ways of understanding how uh, ideas may circulate. Uh, I'm not thinking about air circulation, actually. So if I may, since it's my task is to, uh, to moderate the Q&A and I wait for questions to come, I'd like to uh, pose um, a couple of questions. Maybe they are all related and you can consider them um, in tandem or one after the other. Uh, one of them is something that came to my mind as to as you were talking about how the viewing angles and the way the visitor uh, sort of captures the totality of this vertical rise in your last slide that was very clearly present. Uh, uh, related to that is who are these viewers who gets access to these uh, levels and, and be able to see uh, the statues uh, from a uh, both physical point of view, but also how do they experience it in a spiritual sort of circulatory mode. But the reverse of that, and this is what came to my mind, is how these statues of the Buddha are looking out or commanding a view. And for buildings that seem inward looking, these these statues or the vertical uh, layering, um, do they mean, uh, or do they have additional sort of dimensions of thinking about seeing or commanding or sights or, or sort of the presence of the Buddha from the other angle? So not, not just the visitor worshiper, but also knowledge of the fact that the Buddha is, is watching you in a way or inviting you in a way. It, it was fascinating to me. And I wonder if you can address some of these while we get more questions coming in. Sure, well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Suzanne, for the, uh, the questions. Uh, uh, the, uh, the first one is actually not so easy to answer because we just don't really have so much information about who actually got to visit hmm. uh, the, the temple. But because the, the, the location of the temple was so close to the Forbidden City, hmm. So the so the uh, uh, that kind of shows the, the privilege of the, of the temple status. So uh, and then the, uh, the the commissioner, kind of the major sponsor of the uh, the temple, as I mentioned briefly at the very beginning of my my talk, uh, mm. was Munich, and it's a very very powerful mm. unit during the Ming Dynasty. So I always imagine that that the, the temple was not only just a ordinary temple, so or that and probably will uh, be a, a venue to host. Uh, particular events or even welcome uh, the Tibetan Bud Buddhists, for example. You know, we have some records about the Tibetan Buddhists came visit uh, Beijing uh, from Tibet. And then yeah, during, during the Ming Dynasty in Beijing, there were several Tibetan, uh, Sino Tibetan, uh, the Buddhist temples were established. And uh, Zuhua Temple was one of them. And I suspect, you know, with the, with the status and also uh, the, precious, the precious materials used or exhausted to the construction of the temple, the temple will be a particular space or place to welcome those kind of more high-ranking uh, uh, the, the Buddhists. And some 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 uh, some some scholars have also suggest that because the two levels, on the first level it was much wide open, the sitting height is is taller, is more public, and the second one seems a little bit more intimate, and then mm -hmm. not much used for private worship or something. But I kind of I kind of want to go against that because you can't you just can't separate these two levels, you know, icono iconographically, mm. neither architectural mm. religious, right? They have to be considered as as a, as a one. So so I think that would be a really wonderful way to show off, you know, mm. building whole buildings indeed 
uh, was was a was an eventful thing, right? So, and then get, getting into your second question, I think that's a great question. Uh, the uh, uh, given the architectural landscape in China, in historical China, was very flat, horizontal. <laughs> any any tall buildings is engaging. So the uh, so uh, so when we talk about pagodas or pavilions they, what, with their height, we are thinking about not only the building itself but also its surrounding. It's a kind of built environment to engage in whatever is around it. So if the pagoda is built on top of hill, then you need to think about the eco aspect, you know, how that affects the configuration of the natural, natural terrain, right? Uh, but get to the core, the, the cost of your question. Uh, the, we have a lot of examples where, you know, the, the, the Buddha actually with the open door of the pavilion can see, can, can kind of cast the gaze, you know, through the architecture out, outward. Right, so, and then that can only be done with this building type. You know, you have the single story building, the Buddha doesn't really matter how tall it is, can't really see kind of outward. But pavilion will, will, will elevate that, that viewing point, not only for the visitors, but I think more essentially for the Buddha or Bodhisattvas for them to gaze out. In the case of uh, the, uh, the Guanyin Pavilion, for example, you know, a 22 meter uh, Guanyin statue, you know, very tall. And then on the second level, the, the, when the windows open, you can see the faces right there of the, the, the Bodhisattva. On the other side of the, the town is a pagoda. So actually uh, the, 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 uh, the Bodhisattva is looking you know, in, in, in the distance, in the, in the distance to, the, 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 to the pagoda. So that you have this connection, spatial connection through the viewing of the Bodhisattva. You know, and then of course, you know, the, uh, the architecturally is very important because you know, pavilion will be able to achieve that yeah. uh, rather than any other building types. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah, it's really interesting also to think of that uh, broader sort of urban vistas that you can imagine in these instances. So if I may, I'm going to read to you a few questions that have come in. Uh, and uh, it's uh, one is um, a lot of comments of gratitude and praise for your uh, wonderful presentation. But uh, uh, will it be possible to share the presentation file if uh, Professor uh, Lin allows it? We will wait for that one. <laughs> we can. Uh, we can later on, you can decide on how you want to go for it. Uh, uh, coming from Jennifer M, uh, inspiring presentation. Thank you for that. I like the irony of our virtual meeting, each of us from an assortment of physical locations, which we're discussing such a topic actually, which is uh, really um, an interesting sort of observation, if, if you will. And uh, do I see Stephen's hand up? If and and then of course Austin's hand up. Would you like to pose your questions, Austin. please, Steve, or whichever one? Well, I thank you, Wei, for a really wonderful presentation. I have um, a whole number of questions, but I want to ask just um, a couple of questions about about the typology. Uh, I mean, you made a, an incredibly fascinating fifty minute presentation on on typology which was very exciting and, mm -hmm. and or part on typology and that was very exciting but there so I have two questions if I could and maybe I'll ask them together and then let you answer which ones you do or don't want to the first was thinking about that embodied um experience th that embodied vision of the site I was thinking thinking about slides that you showed in your conclusion you showed first a a a section from the side that showed the that that had replaced the coffered ceiling and also showed the two levels with a with with essentially the open space inside and i had wondered whether um two things the first was the coffered maybe this is entirely a visual thing and there's no real value to this but the coffered ceiling created a sort of um negative space pagoda and i wondered whether there was in sense given the circumambulation that you were describing, a sort of the creation intended as a creation of a, of a sort of heavenly pillar or a Tianzhu concept um, inside, but through negative space that was divided in a sense, I mean, divided in a real sense by the, by the first level, but also in a way that as you point out, this goes to the sort of other part of this, uh, this question is when you showed us a view from the front, I noticed that the Buddha's 
you, you commented that it that you sort of got the sense of the of the verticality. It sort of highlighted its verticality when you saw it in front. But actually, because at least in that shot you showed us, because you saw the upper part of one Buddha and the lower part of the other, it yeah. almost created the the illusion that there was no second floor, that it was a unified space. Now, maybe that's all over reading it. Maybe that elision of the of the of the second level. Of the, of, the, of the presence of that second floor is over reading the space. But I wondered if you think there, that illusion is either conceptually or, or, or visually intended um, or whether really it was intended to know like this. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, this is a great, great uh, suggestion. I think, you know, the, uh, when, I, when I look at the final, the final image, uh, because the, you don't really get to see that uh, any time, every every time when you go to the the the, uh, the temple, because they don't really open up the windows for you and doors for you that way. You know, once in a while they would do that, right? So, and then actually a, st a student of mine uh, uh, gave me the, the the images. So, and I I kept asking the director of the temple, give me some images of that, and then the 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 ones that gave me were not so great. Uh, but when I saw that one, I was really struck by exactly what you say. You know. On top, there's a half, uh, half the, the the upper half body, and then the lower part you have the lower body of the Buddha. So that that kind of just kind of uh, kind of prompted me to think about, you know, the uh, when the Timber Pagoda, the Mutha, the Yingxian Mutha Timber Pagoda has five levels. On the first level, as I pointed out, is Varichana Buddha sitting on the lotus. The top is a Varichana Buddha as well, but that Varichana Buddha is called Folding Zunsen, Toro Nijing, based on that. So the important thing is actually the crown. So on the lower level, we have the, 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 the seats, lotus seats. On top, there's an emphasis on the crown of the Buddha. So the, the, then you have two parts together, you know, kind of continuous rising through the layers and to top. So I, I think to some extent, uh, I also want to say that, you know, when, when we talk about pagoda, it's not just about the verticality, but also, and and then and, and a lot of times, you know, the, uh, 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 the, 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 the interior levels with or without, it, it can't really deny this a verticality, even only with uh, the air shaft, right? So, so this kind of the abstract uh, central column is very, very, very prominent. And that idea is always there. So whenever you have the multi-level multi structures in China, you have to think about the verticality and how that is related to each other. But in particular in Buddhist pavilions, and in our case, that's very clear, you know, so from the first level and second level to the Tiangong Logo, so the, the small structures and the Kafa city, this, 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 they are all streamed together, that's for sure. So, and this streaming together has to be based on a conceptual understanding of the entire building, right? Because you can't really see that, that abstract kind of verticality, right? But there's a different ways the building will reveal that. Just, just like when you come from coming from outside, you see that already, right? So before before you start circumambulating that, so that draws you inside, and you know when you circumambulate, there's an abstract, uh, the uh, the vertical axis, and then once you go in there, and then that unfolds in front of you. So, so I think you know it's it's very plausible that what you have suggested. That's definitely one of the readings, and then that's the reason why they would line up together that way, right? So that's so I think that's very you make a very compelling kind of uh, suggestion. That photo was really a wonderful photo. I mean, it reminds me sort of of, of the photos of the of the Buddha and the Byodoin that sometimes are published where it sort of glows uh -huh. at night. And that was really wonderful. So my second question, um, building on that, or not building, it's moving slightly away, um, has to do with Ge. And I was struck as I was thinking about this. Um, and one of your early images showed the, the Ge as being the Sutra Pavilion. And of course, then later on, you showed us a number of places in which Sutras and Buddhas are, are, um, are cohabitating, if you will, um, uh -huh. both in the Ge. And uh -huh. so I, from, from my own work, I'm much more familiar with Ge as a, as a library structure. And so this is obviously, in the case of a sutra pavilion, is essentially a library. But in the case of a Buddha pavilion, that connection is perhaps less obvious. And so what I guess I'm wondering is, is it just coincident that, that libraries and Buddha pavilions are, are sometimes go? Or is there a, a conceptual 
thing that ties us should we should should i as a, someone who thinks about libraries as buildings be thinking more about buddhism than i do in understanding those buildings um or is this just two different functions for 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 something that we call a good yeah I, I don't know if we can really really kind of lump these two together you know because the library i i don't know the um uh, how far Back we can trace, you know, for the for the uh, the the general, for example, Wen Yuan Ge at the Forbidden City. That's very obvious. You have two stories, and then it, there's a the library space in there, right? So, uh, but this kind of practice, I I wonder how far back we can we, we will be able to trace. But Buddhist uh, pavilion used as a as a, a sutra library was very very early on, right? So all the way back, you know, uh, as early as at least. You know, Liao Dynasty will have the first existing example, and I can check into that. Probably Tang Dynasty will have that as well, already. And a lot of times, you know, in the earlier records um, that I've read, most of the time the sutra cabinets were kept on the second floor. Mm -hmm. So, so the lower level you still have the Buddha image and all that, and then the second level you go up there, then you that that, that will be the, uh, the 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 sutra library. So you can kind of console whatever you want on the second second level. But now uh, more and more, you know, in our case, it's, it's reversed. You have the social libraries on, on the first floor and it's the uh, the, the, uh, the iconography kind of spread uh, into the two levels. So, I, so, so that's why I'm saying, you know, it's really hard to draw a very clear pattern, you know, for, for, the, for the usage of pavilion, just because it's so flexible. You know, so you think about the Chinese architecture is actually, you know, looking from outside, they all look the same because the building technology doesn't really evolve too far away from that, that, that kind of image that you have is a timber frame structure. You know, so the advancement is very minor. Even when I want, want I, I was trying to show you how the mezzanine becomes thinner and smaller, insignificant. It's, it was really hard for me to, you know, address that uh, given that I don't know, you know, the, uh, the general audience, how much they know about Chinese architecture. So but if you look at the diagram, the change is really minor, right? But then, you know, the, the, how the space is being used can be very flexible, right? And then pavilion just, just kind of embodies that, that the essential ideas of Chinese architecture. So, so, so I really like these projects because a lot of times when you talk about, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the throne hall in Forbidden City, Tai He Dian, it's so wide, it's so big, but the function is only one for the emperor to sit in there, right? So it's very mon monumental, but at the same time, it's not like multifunctionality, not, not with the multifunctionality that the pavilions will have. So, so I think that's kind of different ways of understanding architecture space spaces, you know, in two different cases. So, but again, get, getting back to your question, I'm not sure, you know, I will kind of just kind of mix them together, the secular, secular uh, the library and then the Buddhist libraries together and trace them together. And then every time you see, think about the provisions and then immediately you will link to the, the secular or the other way around, I probably won't do that. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Could I could I interrupt there and Austin, I know you're next, but because it seems to me that a question in from the audience might be related to what you just were talking about, the the secular and and the Buddhist context. And this comes from Nishikura. I hope I got your name right. Thanks for this fantastic presentation. I'm curious as to how you think contemporaneous non-Buddhist pavilions, for instance, garden structures, imperial architecture and such, uh, not coffered, but multiple upward layers might affect the worshippers view and impressions of the Buddhist ones. I, am, I imagine that's part of the question. Very great, great, thank you. Thanks, Nixie. I haven't seen you for a while. We I hope you're doing well. Uh, I, I I think the uh, this is a great question, and then and and then I think I make it uh, a a particular effort to say that you know this paper uh, is more specific about Buddhist pavilions, because when we get to the 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 non-religious and the case becomes more complex, uh, the religious one is is a little bit easier for scholars to do a research on because there's an iconographical program inside. So the program immediately will tie the flowers together and then we can start thinking about how the iconography is spatialized inside. And the architecture now will become uh, not just a, a, a background, but a place a more particip participatory role 
in you know creating or or kind of uh, 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 or prescribing the visitor's uh, experience. But then you know the the the, the non-religious secular or let's say kind of uh, the uh, for for leisure purpose. You know, so in China, they, they, they are some, uh, many of them built around the the, uh, the rivers or in the gardens. So, so, so those will be hard to use the same kind of uh, concept. And yet, I would still say that the layers are still very important because when the mezzanine becomes thinner, this is not only specific for for for, for Buddhist architecture. It's, it is also it was also for the secular uh, pavilions as well. So the uh, the technology will do the same thing. And yet, you know, the space is being used in a very different way, right? So, and then were they were they kind of interact with each other? I would say yes. Uh, for pagoda, for, for pagodas, for example, early on, before the Song Dynasty, all the records that you have read will be about, you know, you ascend to to worship uh, the relics enshrined inside. But more and more later on, Song Dynasty onwards, we begin to see you know, records about the visitor going up to the pagodas and walk outside and see the landscape. So worshiping is one thing, but at the same time, simultaneously, you can enjoy that, that view as well. Right? And the pavilion is, uh, is, uh, uh, will present the same case as well. As, you know, especially the pavilions, a lot of times you have veranda outside. So the veranda in our case, because I've read records about uh, the, Pavia, the Buddhist pavilions in during the Ming Dynasty, the dynasty of our discussion, the visit, visitors go go, uh, go up to see the uh, the, the uh, statues on the second uh, on the second level. And next thing next thing the visitor did is that, you know, he went outside, uh, trade on the the, the the veranda around doing the circling emulation and coming down uh, the pavilion. So so I think you know when you go out of the building on the second level on the veranda. That gives you kind of a, a, a sense of th that you are outside and inside both, right? Uh, so, 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 so that, that, that particular point also will serve different functions. You can, you can walk around as a circumambulation, but at the same time, you can look kind of far up. You are, you are much higher than you can look at the, the surrounding uh, that way as well. So uh, the, uh, the, the project that we are working on, uh, the, for the, the Tsuhua Temple is located right in the, in, the Beijing, in, in, in very close to the heart of the Beijing. We scan everything, but we, we couldn't scan the roof because we can't fly drone on top to, to, the, to, to, the, uh, to the sky. The, the, the state government will not allow you to do that. So that, that, that kind of tells you that, you know, that the elevated kind of viewpoint is so, you know, people always desire to have that, right? So, so I think, you know, the, but the elevation, of course, at the elevate, elevating the, the viewpoint, uh, can be for just for uh, the leisure purpose, but at the same time, this elevation can be also religious as well. Just like you know, if you kind of circumambulate the pagoda while ascending, this uh, kind of ascendance also has that religious, religious meaning significance as well. So later, I would say it's really hard to separate these two things. You know, I, I believe the the visitors or the worshippers when they go up to the higher level of the Buddhist pavilions or pagodas. I don't think they, they can just separate that the, the two modes. You know, I want to just worship, not not, not seeing the the, the 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 landscape. I think these two things always come together, right? So, yeah, thank you. With my apologies to Nixie for butchering your name, Austin, would you like to pose your question? Yes. No, thank you so much, Rudy, for this fascinating um, examples and your images. I'm I have so many questions, but I have to put my conservation hat on here and ask you about the coffered ceilings and the polychromy um, that may have once been somewhere and how that also played a role in the perception of these united spaces and different spaces. It was so striking that, you know, that we know that polychromy changes so much from the Tang to the Song to the uh, later dynasties. And I'm curious as to how the polychromy, polychromic decoration inside the building would have reflected the relationship between the different levels and if in your digital re reconstructions you tried to do anything about color changes okay yeah so th that is very technical issue and i'm not sure i can fully answer that you know i can just try my best yeah uh, the uh, uh for the two cover scenes because they, they uh if i can you know if you can go back to my my slides or if you can do a bit of research uh on the, uh, the museum's website you will see they were actually gilt 
So the, the gold, gold powder kind of outside. And then those things will be stored later on as well. Uh, I mean, when, uh, after the, the two pieces enter the museum collections. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the one at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, but if I, if I remember correctly, the one at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art uh, had, had been restored during the 1980s and probably early, early 2000s. They kind of touch up a little bit, just to make sure that you know, the, uh, all the, the missing parts were, were kind of, kind of uh, will, will be, uh, will be uh, uh, kind of make up, you know, put a makeup on so they will look better that way. So, uh, but the rest of the, uh, the buildings, yes, the color scheme was very typical during the, the Ming and Qing dynasty, right? And then the, uh, this, is sign, this is a sign of Tibetan Buddhist temple. So the coffer the cuff sitting is one thing. The thing that I didn't really mention about is the sitting panels. So you have cover, cover, uh, uh, the, the, the cover sitting at a central bay and then the left and right base on top, uh, they are about uh, 80 something or uh, uh, I'm, I'm wrong, it's about 108 panels. Those panels, most of them are still, still in the collection of Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. And each panel has a mandala. So this uh, this uh, uh, this uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the C script that represent a particular uh, most of them represent the uh, uh, Buddha Amitabha. So the color scheme is very specific, right? So and then we haven't really done a whole lot of research on that. But one of our collaborators uh, from Tsinghua University in China, uh, one professor there named uh, Li Lu Ke, who is a specialist in the uh, the architectural painting. So all the paintings that you will see on the, the timber frames, right? So, so, so she had done a lot of research on that. And then uh, doing not only just uh, the historical research, but also scientific research. They're using different devices to see the, the, the kind of color that's still there and how old they are, right? So, so they have been able to reconstruct the color uh, scheme for the entire structure for us. So our reconstruction, uh, the Xi'an Jiao Tong University has a digital lab and we work with them because uh, University of Chicago doesn't really have that, uh, that, that capacity, unlike you guys have that capacity to do that. We don't. So we work with uh, the couple institutions. So when they scan, they reconstruct the whole thing. They, uh, uh, in consultation with the Tsinghua University's team, they try to uh, kind of the, uh, the adjust the color as close, as close uh, as possible to the original uh, appearance of the temple. So I think that's probably as much as I can tell you, you know, the kind of the work that we have done in order to capture the original color. So my final image, we are looking from, from below and to see the coffer scene, entire whole thing. If you look at the, the panels on, on the side, the color is actually very new. And that, that's kind of what we want to do because you can never really reconstruct a building to, you know, uh, say, you know, the, uh, 100 years later after it was built. Right, so so it, it, there's no accurate way to do that. So we kind of reconstruct to the moment when it was built. So it looks kind of new, but at least it gives you a sense of of experience. So I would say the color there is pretty precise, but precise based on the research that we have done. But as far as the appearance, of course, you know it looks so new that you probably won't, some people may not like it. Right, so uh, but that's kind of limits of this kind of digital project. That's how much and how far we'll be able to go. So, so I hope I answer questions. Well, that, that's great. I'm, I'm often struck by the newness sometimes of the architectural restorations that we see mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. and always ask how, because I know that many of the polychrome sculptures in, 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 inside uh, pagodas and temples have been also multi, re restored and different color schemes have been placed on top. But this is a very good answer. And um, I, I look forward to reading more about this. I'm gonna pass back to Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a question about what kind of wood was used in the temples, particularly the scaffolding temple frame and support beams comes from Robin C. Well, I, you know, you have to pardon me because I don't really know, you know, so the, <laughs> okay. only, thing, the only thing I know is that, you know, I probably the uh, Stephen can help me. Uh, the coffer scene, uh, the, uh, the one that I, uh, the, the focus of my discussion right now at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, they have done research on that. They've done the lab test on that. And it is Namu. So I don't know, do, do, you, know, do you know the, the English term uh, off, off, off your head? Uh, I don't know it off my head, but I can look at, 
I, I happen to be holding a dictionary in my hand. I'll look up the name and see what I can find out. <laughs> yeah, so that, that is actually a very precious and then uh, mm. uh, more expensive uh, the timber material available during the Ming Dynasty. For example, you know, the Forbidden City, the, uh, the throne hall was entirely made of that wood. Right. So, uh, but the uh, so you, uh, I today I show two different cover scenes. One is the focus of my discussion. The other one is uh, initially was in the the main main Buddha Hall. Why not at the Philadelphia Museum of Art? So Philadelphia Museum of Art also also did some tests on the woods there. The two cover scenes were made uh, with two different woods, two different kind of timbers. So that kind of tells you that you know the. Uh, um, it's really without doing further research, we, we may not be able to decide, you know, what kind of timber, you know, the the, the structure was built. So mm -hmm. that's a, that's that's a really good question for our further research in the future. So yeah. thank you. Great. Um, there is a question from Ricardo, which I need your help for, Stephen. <laughs> okay. So the the answer, first of all, it Nanmu. Uh, oh, which of course I wrote wrong, which is why it didn't come up. Is that it's a it's a species of the um, of the Phoebe family, or, or of the genus Phoebe of the family. <laughs> I think of a, I think it's related to a type of laurel is the answer. Um, but it is as as Wei says a very precious wood. Now the next question coming from um, Ricardo Brosh. Um, is it, the answer to the question ultimately ways there is no word in English for it, only in Latin, um, is I wonder whether you think your alternative translation for Tsung should also apply to non-Buddhist architecture. Yeah, sure. I, I think that that will be, uh, that will be the, 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 uh, the idea I want to advocate uh, because, you know, I, I probably don't really know enough about the architectural traditions outside of China. So I don't really, I can't really, Kind of a resort to other other sources, but in Chinese tradition, when we talk about the multi-story structures, you know the pagodas or the pavilions. A lot of times, you, you know the uh, uh, we I think the uh, because the percentage of the pavilions that that were built to accommodate a tall structure, a tall images, was so great. You know, in China, even today, you know, if you uh, the, there are several uh, uh, the uh, pavilions still standing. Uh, constructed from the past three three uh, three hundred years, a lot of them were actually were, built, were were constructed for the very central colossal statues inside. So because of that tradition, you know, thinking about the tall structures, oftentimes there's a big things in there. So kind of traversing the levels is always there. I think for people's uh, vi uh, the uh, the spatial experience with the tall structures. So, so I think going outside of the, uh, the religious pavilions, even for the secular pavilions, this kind of traversing, you know, level by level and uh, the connecting between levels. So these ideas level uh, layers comes in because when we think about layers, layers is more, you know, for example, when you have a space and you have the, the vertical layers, then you feel like the space is, the space, is, the, the space has, a, has a greater depth because there's several layers, right? So I think the build, the tall buildings will serve the same thing. We have layers, you know, in the vertical sense, then the building becomes taller and then each level can relate to each other. So I think that I probably, you know, I think this question just kind of, uh, kind of uh, prompt me to write another paper on the pavilion buildings that related to religion, right? So, so I think you know, once I have the opportunity to do that kind of research, I may be able to answer this question better. But my gut feeling is that you know, this kind of layering ideas should be able to apply to the non non religious pavilions as well. But you know, uh, give me some time; <laughs> I'll get back to you with the answer with the another sounds, paper. Sounds very promising. <laughs> so here's a question from LC. Uh, first, a thank you for the fantastic presentation. In addition to colossal symbols, the 10,000 Buddhas and other elements, could you elaborate on examples of where symbolism and significance from the scrolls translates into the architecture and form? From the, from the, from the scroll? Uh, I mean, I mean, like a painting scroll, 10,000 Buddha. I mean, let me think about this. Uh, because I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly, you know, the, what the scroll refers to. But I think the, she uh, means the sutra. A sutra. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, from the sutra. Oh, okay. All right. So the 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 tenth. Uh, yeah, I can't really tell you off my head what sutras that 
uh, from which the 10,000 Buddhas mm. arise. Yeah, but the 10,000 Buddha, uh, for example, Qianfo means 1,000 Buddha, Wanfo means 10,000 Buddha. Those two terms we use a lot, you know, to describe, you know, the inter kind of interrelated uh, universe uh, or worlds of Buddhas, you know, coexisting with ours that form the entire universe. So, for example, you know, the, uh, the, the Mogao Cave in Dunhuang, is all, the, another name for that is called Qianfo Dong. So it's a cave site of thousand Buddhas, right? So, and indeed, a lot of uh, the caves, when you walk inside, you will see the, the small Buddha images kind of all over the entire, entire wall, right? So, so that motif is always there. And then not only that, but also, you know, so some of the scroll, um, the, it's not really paintings, but uh, the scroll has been used to, 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 uh, for, for, for practitioner to stamp the image of the, the, the small Buddha in the mm -hmm. over again. So when you open up the, the, them, then you have a whole bunch of the, the Buddha small images together. So a lot of times we'll call that as a thousand Buddha, 10,000 Buddha as well. So all these terms are not precise. So for example, for the 10,000 Buddha pavilion, and then we count it, it's not 10,000, it's about 900, 9,900 uh, 9, <laughs> something. Right, so we're close to that, close to that, that number, but, but I think that idea is to represent the entire universe. Mm -hmm. Vajrayana Buddha is exactly that embodiment of that entire universe because Vajrayana Buddha is more abstract. It's kind of universal Buddha, we say that, right? So, and then the, and, and then the, uh, uh, and then in the, in the, in the Sino uh, Tibetan Buddhist concept, then the, the Vajrayana Buddha has another, has another role sitting in the, the diamond, uh, the diamond world mandala. So, so these two things become kind of overlapping with each other. And indeed, we we, we saw that in the in this building, surrounding the the statue is ten thousand Buddha, and he and then Vajrayana Buddha sitting in the middle and representing the mandala as well. So again, uh, I have to apologize because I can I can come up with the names of the sutra right away, you know, uh, from which the concept ten thousand Buddha uh, derived, but. You know the uh, I welcome to contact me. You can find my, my email uh, on my on the West School website, and I would be happy to email you the uh, the, the 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 precise name of the, the sutra. Mm. Thank you so much, Wei. This was no. wonderful. I'm gonna be taking the executive um, decision that at this point we all join together to thank you for this wonderful presentation, a virtual or real uh, clapping of hands, and then announce to everyone in the audience that the fourth talk in the series is going to be on the 15th of March by Ashley Thompson from SOAS. And, and thank you to all of those people who went into a lively, back and forth on the type of wood that was used. And, <laughs> and we look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you very much. This you was so much. wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. And goodbye to everyone. Good okay. night to everyone. Thank Bye. You. Thank you.